Hello again. This is the last lesson in this series that we've been going through the Beatitudes for the last several weeks. And uh, one of the problems that I run into is a lot of times when I talk to people about the Beatitudes, they look at it as a, a list of pick and choose. Uh, the things that you struggle with more, let's, let's focus on those. The others, well, not so much. Uh, if there's something that I see a particular type of blessing that I want in the list of Beatitudes, well, I'll work on the first part of that so that I can get that blessing. But really, when we look at the Beatitudes, they all are progressive. They start with blessed are the poor in spirit because we recognize our sin. Blessed are those who mourn because we're mourning over the fact that we have something uh, separating us from God. And then when we need to make a change. And right on through, we see each step. Uh, it, it goes through them confessing our sinfulness, repentance, which is that mourning, which also leads us to hungering and thirsting for righteousness to seek a pure heart, uh, to put our life in God's hands. That's that meekness, using our strength to accomplish God's good, God's purpose for our life. And right on through. And the last lesson that we looked at was blessed are the peacemakers. And so as we become Christians, we're supposed to be helping draw others into a peaceful relationship with God by teaching and preaching the, the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news of Jesus how other people can become part of the kingdom of God. And so when we get to the very last character trait, Jesus wants his followers to understand that everything's not always going to be happy and, and just go the way we want it to go as we teach and preach. There's going to be a lot of people who don't want to hear uh, the message of Jesus Christ. And so that's why the very last beatitude doesn't get one verse, but it actually gets three verses of scripture to explain what this this beatitude's all about. It's a kingdom uh, characteristic. If we're going to be part of God's kingdom, he says in Matthew 5, verses 10 through 12, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. So I think it's interesting that Jesus, to make peace between us and God, was persecuted to the point of death. But before he ever reached that point, all throughout Jesus' ministry, he demonstrates what it is to live a righteous life, to live right according to God's word, according to God's will, uh, no matter what happened to him. And so as he begins to think about the cross, about the death, burial, and resurrection, what it's going to cost to make peace between man and God, uh, he wants to warn his disciples all throughout the ministry that there are going to be good times, there's going to be bad times. When we think about the gospel, we oh, a lot of times think about the miracles of Jesus. And we think about the happy times that we see in scripture with Jesus and his apostles when he heals someone, when he raises someone from the dead, and the joy that's brought about. But a lot of times people overlook all those hard passages, those hard teachings. And so this really brings us to that close. And he says, with everything that I've told you, you need to be to be part of the kingdom of God. The last part of that is you need to be willing to be faithful to the point of death, even through persecution. And something that we see in America is that uh, persecution is on the rise against uh, Christianity, against those who hold to the truth of Jesus Christ. And it's nothing new. It's just, to me, it seems to be coming more out of the woodwork. And so we see this uh, going on all throughout the ages. We see it in, in all the different countries where Christians live. Uh, but Jesus says, this is a mark of following me. So when we think about these three verses, there, there's three points that Jesus, I think, really brings out. In the beginning, he says, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Uh, and what he's telling us is, he says, if you're going to live according to my teaching, if you're going to live according to the, the, the scriptures, the, the Bible, uh, he says that you're going to be in conflict with a lot of people in this world who don't see it as the word of God, who don't believe in God, uh, who believe there's many ways to heaven. And so he says, because of this, there's going to be conflict. There's going to be tension between what you're teaching, what others are teaching. There's going to be conflict between uh, the truth and all the deceptions that, that we face throughout the world. And so he says, persecution is something that's going to identify you as a kingdom citizen. 
Notice he says that if you're persecuted for righteousness sake, he says yours, your blessing is the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. So again, he's bringing us full circle. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Here he says, blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sakes, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He's talking about the same thing, but he's bringing us full circle from the beginning to the end. So let's look at what it means to be persecuted for righteousness sake, for Christ's sake. Uh, because not all persecution is, is something that we ought to, to embrace. Uh, not all suffer, suffering is created equal. And so when we look at this, uh, we realize that what he's talking about is he says, are you being persecuted for truly living out my teaching? Are you not only hearing it, accepting it, saying you're a Christian, but are you actually living the teaching of Jesus Christ completely? He says, if you are, you're going to face persecution. But he says, you know, I want you to not just take my teaching and, and, and pick and choose the parts you want. I want you to seek God's kingdom fully. That's why in the Sermon on the Mount, the same sermon you get deeper in, in Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, it says, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Excuse me, allergy season's got me all stuffed up. Uh, when you think about it, the Beatitudes, each, each one of these characteristics, each one of these attitudes that we're supposed to have, character traits that we're supposed to take on, have a specific blessing. Some of these blessings we experience in this life, some of them we'll experience in eternity, like the blessing that we're talking about here. Uh, but with all of it, he says, we need to seek fully God's kingdom. We need to seek fully, what does God's word say? What is God's will? What does it mean to be righteous according to God's word? And as he, we, we seek these things, he says, all the other blessings of life, God's going to bring our way in due time, according to, to his plan. And so you think about this particular verse, it's found in a passage where Jesus is talking about not worrying, not being anxious about everything in life. He says, the world as a whole worries about everything. Uh, people worry about what they're going to eat, what they're going to wear, where they're going to live, what kind of job they're going to have. Uh, you know, they worry about whether they're going to sick, whether they're going to die. Uh, we worry, worry, worry. And Jesus says, you know what? T tomorrow's got enough to worry about. Uh, today's got enough to worry about. Don't worry about these things because you can't change most of them. But he says, but if you'll seek God's will, you'll seek his righteousness. You'll seek how you should live day to day in your work in your family relationships, in your interactions with other people, he says, then you're going to be able to experience the blessing of God. These things are going to fall in place in God's time, in God's way. It doesn't always mean we're going to have the life we want. Uh, you know, wants and needs are two different things. But he says, as we trust God and we seek his kingdom, he says, all the blessings that we need in life are going to fall in place. But he says, as you do these things, you are going to face a certain amount of persecution. Uh, sometimes it's verbally. People simply saying, oh, I don't believe what you have to say. Sometimes people get more aggressive. You know, you're a Jesus freak. What do you, why do you teach like that? Why do you believe that? Why do you live the way you do? Why don't you enjoy life more? But then sometimes it gets a lot more physical, even to the point of, uh, of death. And we see that in Jesus' day, we see it in the world today. And so that's why he goes on in verse 11, he makes a distinction. Verse 10, he talked in more general terms. Blessed are those, the general category. Blessed are those who suffer for righteousness sake, who are persecuted for doing what is right, uh, e even when it means uh, consequences that we'd rather not have to deal with. Verse 11, he goes on to say, blessed are you. He makes it personal. So the first part is the general category. Are you part of those who want to live right according to God's word? He says, if you are, you're going to face persecution. But in verse 11, he makes it personal. Are you willing to hear the teaching of Jesus Christ? Are you willing to do what he has called us to do, what he has called us to teach others to do, uh, what he's called us to teach about the future and, and what's going to happen as time continues to travel forward? Uh, he says, are you personally willing to suffer uh, what people may say against you, what may, people may do against you, evil that people may speak against your character, uh, even though it's, it, it's a false character assassination, uh, simply because they don't agree with your way of life. He says, if you're willing to do these things, there is blessing in it. But he goes from those to you, from suffering for righteousness sake to suffering for Christ's sake. 
So he's taking it from general terms and bringing it down to a personal level. And he says, are you personally willing to study the scriptures? Are you personally willing to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior? Are you personally willing to teach his word completely? Not just the easy parts, not just the okay parts, but everything about God's word. He says, if you are, he says, then you're going to be my follower. And that's going to identify you. The Apostle Peter, in his letter, writes the same thing. In 1 Peter 4, verses 14 through 16, we read, If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of the glory of God, excuse me, because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Let yet if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. So what is Peter saying? He's saying the same thing Jesus did. Uh, Peter was willing to count the cost of being a disciple of Jesus, being one of his followers, one of his students, one who would lead the church of Jesus Christ. And so he's talking to the church here and he says, you know what? If people speak bad about you just because you are a Christian, because you wear the name of Jesus, he says, don't be ashamed of that. Don't be ashamed to be persecuted for that faith. He says, in fact, you need to praise God that you were counted worthy uh, to, to be persecuted the same way Jesus was persecuted. People talked about Jesus all the time. Uh, as we've gone through, we've looked at some of the ways the Pharisees spoke about Jesus. Well, if he knew who they were, he wouldn't have anything to do with them. Why is he with the sinners, the tax collectors, the prostitutes? Why is he ministering to the sick? Why is he doing all these things instead of being a great teacher and just having the cream of the crop come to listen to him? And so Jesus was persecuted in different ways all throughout his ministry. The apostles were persecuted to the point of death. The early church uh, members were persecuted to the point of death. And Jesus told them that this was the cost of following him. He never hid this. Look at uh, Luke chapter 21, and just a few verses here, but Luke 21 verses 12 to 13, after uh, Jesus tells them uh, a lot of things that have to happen before the end of time comes, before Christ would return, he says this, he says, but before all this, they will lay hands on you and persecute you, delivering you up to the synagogues and prisons. And you will be brought before kings and governors for my name's sake. This will be your opportunity to bear witness. And you drop down to verse 17 and Luke 21, 17 says, you will be hated by all for my name's sake. A lot of people don't like to hear these verses because Jesus gives us a lot of great teaching. He gives us a lot of exciting teaching. We see a lot of joy happen because of the, the ministry of Jesus. But he says, but I want you to understand living the Christian life has a cost. And that cost is persecution for your faith. Persecution for living according to God's righteousness, not the world's righteousness. Living according to the teaching of Jesus and sharing that through your life, through your words, through your example. And he tells them, he says, there's not, not going to be long that, that, that things are going to change for you. Jesus was going to be handed over uh, to go through the trial, which really was a mockery of a trial. He was going to be persecuted to the point of death, burial, but he would rise from the grave. He would ascend back to the Father. And as he did, he told him, he said, go be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, to the ends of the earth. And I want you to be my witnesses. I want you to give a testimony of faith. I want you to teach the things that I've taught you, the things that you've seen, the things you've experienced. And I want you to do it even to the point of being persecuted yourself. Notice all the things he says here. He keeps saying you, you, you. He says you are going to be persecuted. You are going to be handed over to religious leaders that, that don't agree with the teaching of Jesus Christ. There's going to be conflict within religion. And he says, you're going to face persecution there. He says, you're going to be in prison for your faith. I had a friend, uh, uh, when we went to a, a prayer retreat one time, one of the preachers said, you know, have you ever been put in prison for your faith? Have you ever been persecuted for your faith? And if not, why not? Jesus says, you will face persecution in one way, shape, or another if you are going to follow his teaching and teach it 
the way he taught it. And so he says, you will be handed over to be in prison. You're going to be handed over to stand before governing leaders. The apostles did that. We're going to look at it in a minute. But the idea was Jesus warned them ahead of time. He says, if you're going to be a Christian, if you're going to enter the kingdom of God, if you're going to go to heaven, as people like to say, then there is a cost. Jesus paid the cost for our sin. Salvation is free. But he says, but you have to make a choice. Are you going to accept it, embrace it, teach it, and it's full or not? People don't like to hear this. Jesus said, people are going to hate you for my name's sake. People want to be accepted. People want to be welcomed. People don't want to be hated. But Jesus says, if we will truly live a Christian life, people are going to hate us simply for teaching the truth. You know, when you think about the, the apostles, uh, they, they had a lot of persecution that they faced. And in Acts chapter 4 and 5, we see that firsthand uh, at the hands of the Jewish leaders. Uh, they were brought before the court, known as the Sanhedrin. And they were told not to preach and teach the name of Jesus. And they essentially said, you know what, do what you want, but we're going to keep teaching and preaching Jesus Christ. That's the kind of attitude Christians need today, that no matter what you say, no matter what others do, uh, be it the government or individual people, uh, Jesus says we need to be willing to stand for the truth and acknowledge it no matter what happens. A, a few verses in these two chapters really stand out. Acts 4 verse 13 says, Now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they are uneducated, that they were uneducated, common men, they were astonished. And they recognized that they had been with Jesus. You know, just stop there and recognize something. He says they didn't go to Bible college. They didn't go to seminary. They didn't have specific training. They had one thing. They had a love for Jesus Christ. They were preaching what Jesus taught. They were doing the miracles by the power of the Holy Spirit that Jesus said that he was going to give them the ability to do. And as they did these things in the name of Jesus, they faced the persecution that he said that they were going to face. But as they stood before these leaders, they could either put them in jail, could have them flogged, which they did both. Uh, you know, they stood before them and these people recognized something. How is it that people are listening to them? How is it that people's lives are changing for the better? How is it that people as a whole are leaving us to, to gravitate to these people? Because they're uneducated. They're common folk. The only thing that distinguished them was they could tell they had been with Jesus. There was something that Jesus had impacted their lives. Go on to, to Acts chapter 5, verse 41 and 42, and it says, Then they left the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer dishonor for the name, the name of Jesus. And every day in the temple and from house to house, they did not see teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ. You know, instead of giving up and saying, man, I don't want to go to jail again because of my faith. I don't want to be whipped again because of my faith. I don't want to be put down in the eyes of, of my peers because of my faith. They said, no, we're going to praise God. He said these things were coming. We're going to count it as a badge of honor. And we're going to keep teaching and preaching Jesus Christ, no matter what it means to us. Because people are coming to a saving relationship with Jesus as the Christ, the Messiah. They are entering the kingdom of God. And we're going to keep doing it. And so it says, even after being jailed, even after being whipped, they, they leave praising God that they were counted worthy to suffer the same way Jesus did. Many of the apostles would ultimately suffer to the point of death, uh, even being uh, hung on a cross themselves. But you think about just the rest of the book of Acts, it continues from there. You get to Acts chapter 6 and 7, and there was a man named Stephen, and he was called to give a testimony of faith. And as he preached and teach uh, from the Old Testament right on up to the Christ and, and told people, look, it's because of your sins that Jesus was crucified. It's because of you that he was crucified. His blood's on your hands. They didn't want to hear that. They dragged him out in the street. They stoned him to death. Think about other apostles. Think about the apostle Paul. How many times he was arrested, even taken all over the world to go to Rome to be able to stand trial. But when he did, he, he continued to rejoice and to praise God. In Acts chapter 19 and 20, uh, Paul was dragged before the courts, or they tried to drag him before the courts, rather, and uh, they couldn't find him. So they took some of his friends, some other Christians, and they dragged him before the courts, and they had him beat. And instead of getting bitter about it, they got Paul out of town so he could go to preach another day. 
And so that's the resolve the early church had. That's the kind of resolve Christians today need to have, that no matter what's going on, no matter what kind of persecution you, you suffer for, for living a right life, not living a wrong, a false uh, a life, he says, for Christ's sake, for righteousness' sake, doing that which is true, speaking that which is true at any cost, he says, if you will do these things, there is blessing in it. And it will draw persecution. The early church was willing to suffer that way. Are you? Am I? Well, persecution does bring its own reward. Uh, in Luke 21, verse 19, Jesus would go on to say, By your endurance, you will gain your lives. The ironic thing is, Jesus says, If you lose your life for my sake, you will gain your life in eternity. Uh, he says, persecution may not get to the point of losing your life, but if it does, he says, it's okay because the blessing is eternal life with God, the Father, and the Son. It's an eternal reunion with those who have been faithful throughout time, who have continued to teach and preach. Uh, the book of Revelation is full of these pictures of those that were martyred for their faith and how Jesus shows the picture of them being blessed, them being comforted, those being able to have authority and to rule in eternity with him. And so he says, this is the reward. It's a personal blessing. Matthew 5, 11 and 12 told us in the beginning, blessed are you when others revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. In other words, they slander you. But he says, rejoice and be glad for your reward is great in heaven. For so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. All throughout the Old Testament, all throughout the New Testament, you cannot get away from the fact that when God's people spoke the truth, when they lived according to God's word, they faced persecution. So this final beatitude has three verses and they all point to the same thing. If you are going to be faithful, you will face persecution. But in the end, in eternity, you will have the blessed life, eternal life. But you know, this persecution isn't just for our personal benefit. It's to benefit others. As people look at our lives and look at the way at times we suffer for simply teaching the truth of Jesus, simply proclaiming to be a Christian, simply trying to, to draw others into a right way of life according to God's word, uh, he says, you're supposed to be helping benefit others. Remember that peacemaking part of it? Blessed are the peacemakers, those who are trying to make peace between individuals, those who are helping people to, to come to a relationship that makes them at peace with, with God through Jesus Christ. He says that's what persecution is supposed to be all about too. We're not supposed to be persecuted for doing those things that are wrong, for evil, but he says do what is right and it's going to impact other people's lives as they see you handle that suffering in a certain way. You know, in Acts chapter 16, there's a passage that, that shows us a, a, a scene in the life of ministry of Paul and another man named Silas. Paul and Silas had gone and they were ministering in a particular town. And, uh, you know, to be able to understand what's going on, there was a, a slave girl, it says, and she was demon possessed and she followed them all around town. Well, something interesting about her ability was to be able to tell the future, to be able to tell people their, their futures. But she told the people, he said, these men are servants of the Most High God who proclaim to you the way of salvation. The demon allowed her to know exactly who they were, what their ministry was about. Demons know what Jesus is all about. They know his ministry. They know the ministry of Christians. And so this, this girl is able to tell the people, hey, these men are telling you the way of salvation. But it was what they were saying. It wasn't what they were saying, what this woman was saying. It was who was leading her to say this. And so Paul finally had enough of it after a few days and drove the demon out by the name of Jesus Christ. And it caused a lot of trouble for him because now this girl wasn't able to tell the future anymore. And so her owners were losing their meal ticket. So they drag them before the authorities and say they're teaching and, and proclaiming things that Romans shouldn't do. And so without really having any kind of trial or information about who they were, they were flogged. They were put in the jail. They had their feet bound in stocks. Now, they could have just said, you know what? I'm tired of this. I'm tired of teaching and preaching. I'm tired of facing persecution everywhere we go. But instead, listen to what they did. Acts 16, verse 25. About midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the prisoners were listening to them. 
So here's a couple of men. They could have been bitter. They could have been upset. They could have been, this is not fair. Why is the world treating us like this? We're trying to help them. We're trying to teach them the way to have a better life with God, with each other, but they don't want to listen. You know what? I give up. Once we get out of here, we're never preaching Jesus again. Instead, they're whipped. They're tired. They're hurting. Their feet are in the stocks. They're in the middle of this jail. And about midnight, they start singing praise songs. They start singing hymns. They start having a worship service. And notice what it says happened. All the inmates are listening. It was an opportunity to be that witness, to have that testimony that Jesus said, you will be persecuted, but it will be a witness. It will be a testimony to others. And so they use that opportunity to instead of railing against those who were treating them in a, a false manner in a wrong way, they start singing praise to God. Yeah, I think that'd get my attention too if people had been through this. You know, they, they know what's going on. But then all of a sudden something else happens. Drop down to verse 26 and through 33 it says, And suddenly there was a great earthquake so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. And immediately all the doors were opened and everyone's uh, bonds were unfastened. When the jailer woke and saw that the prison doors were open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself, supposing that the prisoners had escaped. But Paul cried out with a loud voice, do not harm yourself, for we are all here. And the jailer called for lights and rushed in and trembling with fear, he fell down before Paul and Silas. Then he brought them out and said, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they said, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved, you and your household. And they spoke the word of the Lord to him and to all who were in his house. And he took them the same hour of the night and washed their wounds. And he was baptized at once, he and all his family. So they were persecuted for their faith. They were whipped. They were thrown in jail. They had their feet bound in the stocks. All of a sudden, they have a midnight worship session. There's a great earthquake. The doors fly open. The, the bonds fall off. All the inmates are just kind of looking around at each other. Maybe they're staring at Paul and Silas. They don't know what to do. You know, today, most inmates would probably try to make a break for it. But for whatever reason, they hear these men singing songs and praising their God. This earthquake happens, their bonds fall off, the doors fly open, and all they can do is sit there in astonishment. Whoa, what's going on? The jailer wakes up. He looks in. There's no light. He can't see what's going on. All he can imagine is that everybody has left, which means he's responsible to take their punishment. So he's ready to kill himself. And yet Paul could have just let him do it and then everybody walk out. But instead he cries out, don't kill yourself. We're still here. Don't harm yourself. Don't do anything rash. All the inmates, we're all here still. There's no reason for that. With everything that happened, the way they responded to persecution, it says the jailer asked, what do I need to do to be saved? What do I need to do to have the kind of life that you have? And he says, you need to have faith in Jesus. You need to accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. But notice he didn't stop there. He continued to teach the word of Jesus the gospel to him. And it says that he was convicted. He came to a point of faith. And that very hour, he and his whole household were baptized into Jesus Christ. They identified with Christianity. They identified with the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus in baptism. And so we see that rejoicing that took place. That blessing was no longer their personal blessing. It was something they shared. Their persecution became a testimony of faith and it drew more people into the kingdom of God. So when Jesus tells us what it is to be a citizen of the kingdom of God, he says it starts out with you. Are you poor in spirit? Are you willing to recognize that compared to God, you, you know, you are sinful. You don't deserve any blessing and grace. Are you willing to mourn that sinful state and say, Lord, I need your forgiveness. I need a change. I need you to help me change. I want to identify with you. I want to submit my life to you fully. I want to submit my power and strength to you. And that's what baptism was all about. It was about identifying with what Jesus had been through. It was for the forgiveness of sin and to receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's what Acts 2.38 tells us. But when we go on, it's continuing to grow, to have a pure heart. It's hungering and thirsting to know more of God's word, that we might know it, we might live it, we might teach it. It's to be able to help us to, to demonstrate the mercy of God on people that don't deserve mercy, because that's what mercy is in and of itself. 
It's to be able to help people come to peaceful relationships with each other. Uh, for us to live in peace so much as possible with us, with other people. But it's also going to lead to persecution in some way, shape, or form. If we continue to teach and live out the full word of God. So when we come full circle, Jesus says, if you're going to follow me, if you're going to listen to the rest of the sermon, I want you to understand some things right up front. This is what it looks like to truly be my follower. This is what it requires if you're going to enter the kingdom of heaven, if you're going to be part of God's kingdom. He says, but you need to count the cost. As we've gone through all these lessons, he brings us to the hardest lesson of all and says, you will be persecuted for your faith. Are you willing to do that? Because if we're not, he says, then you're not worthy of the kingdom of God. This is a hard lesson to teach. It's a hard lesson to hear. Most people don't want to hear this lesson, but it's still part of the Beatitudes. It's something we must hear if we are to accept the teaching of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Lord, I thank you for this time, and I thank you for all that you've allowed us to go through. I pray that you would use these lessons to challenge us, to encourage us. Lord, help us to be willing to identify with you fully. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.